that interplay between the world of the city and the intellectual and the frontier, uh, the forest, the wild, was a really important context for permaculture to emerge. Yes, well, I met Bill Mollison in 1974. Uh, we had a close, intense working relationship that led to the publication of Permaculture One in 1978. Uh, the first permaculture design course Bill Mollison ran in 1981. Uh, and all of those things were in Tasmania, Australia's smallest state, only half a million people. It was a place which had, had a very interesting history uh, where people, like most places in Australia, mostly living in cities, but Tasmania had much more of a strong rural connection. The connection between the city and the country was much stronger than in other places. Great history of savage environmental exploitation, uh, terrible treatment of indigenous people, uh, criminal um, settlement history, but also one of the places that modern environmentalism actually emerged in the world. It's acknowledged as the origin point of the first um, green political party in, in the world. Bill Mollison was part of that social circle of radical thinkers. Uh, he was um, an academic at the time that I met him, but an unusual academic in that he'd been a bushman and a research assistant to scientists uh, and uh, came really from that uh, bush pioneering culture of timber cutters, rabbit trappers, fishermen. He'd been all of those things. The, that interplay between the world of the city and the intellectual and the frontier, uh, the forest, the wild, was a really important context for permaculture to emerge. Uh, so that was something special about Tasmania. It was the place where there was the first organisation devoted to organic uh, agriculture and gardening, um, founded in 1972, and Bill Mollison was a founding member of that, so that was just two years before I met him. It was also the place where I was a student in a course called Environmental Design, uh, which Bill Mollison was not connected to, he was in a different university, uh, but that course um, was the most radical experiment in tertiary education in Australia's history, I believe. It was a generalist course leading to postgraduate qualifications in architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning. And it attracted all the radicals and dissidents from around Australia to Hobart to be part of that school. So I was there in that environment where there was all of the latest radical environmental thinking. And if we look back and say, well, that sort of radical environmental thinking, it must have been very small back in the 70s. It's not true. It was actually huge, very large, because at least in the affluent and especially English speaking countries uh, of the world, there was a huge interest in things that we would call sustainability today. Uh, organic agriculture, intentional communities, um, alternative technology, uh, um, methods of empowering people to be owner builders, um, new ideas in economics. Because that coincided with the oil crises of 1973, in 1979. So between those two there was this first 
unraveling of the constant economic growth from the end of the Second World War uh, until it hit the effects of the, the first oil crisis in 1973. And environmental thinking had, you know, come to the fore to an amazing degree. So there was a strong interest in all of the things that permaculture was about, which explains why, yes, Bill Mollison's charisma as a, a public speaker was important, but why was it that six mainstream publishers approached a rather unknown academic from Tasmania and a completely unknown uh, graduate student wanting to publish the manuscript of Permaculture One in 1977? What was going on for that to be possible? So there was this huge upheaval of all these ideas. So that was not a Tasmanian thing, it was really right through the Western world. And even beyond, uh, a pioneer of that phase, um, Peter Harper, who actually claims to have coined the, the term alternative technology in a pub in London in 1970, was at Tehran University in the architecture faculty in 1977. And he said all of the latest thinking in passive solar design, natural materials, all of these ideas were very much a part of uh, that, that context in, in Tehran. So I think it's only really in the recent years, the last 10 years, that we've now seen an interest in these, these areas which is bigger than that wave that happened in the 1970s. So, in a way, the permaculture manuscript and the work that Bill and I did between 1974 and 76 was perfect timing. And uh, so the expansion of permaculture was possible in that period. And I date the end of that period, especially in the Australian context, being 1983. And ironically, that's the year that a government was elected for the first time on an environmental issue predominantly, which was the damming of the Franklin Wilderness River in Tasmania, which the state government in Tasmania was trying to force through, and the federal election was won by the late Australian Labor Party saying we will stop the dam. So environmentalists thought that that was the dawning of the golden age of environmental thinking, but it was actually the end of it. Because what we got was under the Hawke-Keating government in 1983 was the Thatcherite Reaganite revolution with a human face. <laughs> you know, not as extreme as the policies that were instituted uh, by Margaret Thatcher in 1979 in Britain and then Ronald Reagan in 1981. So although those, those were social economic policies, they also pushed aside the sustainability debate and said, you know, we can have economic growth again, energy is again cheap. And of course there's a Latin American precursor to that in the, uh, the coup against the first elected Marxist government in the world in Chile in 1973, uh, and Augusto Pinochet coming to power, and his chief economic advisor becoming Margaret Thatcher's chief economic advisor. So we got a very gentle version of that in in Australia, but it was essentially the same lineage. And so permaculture didn't uh, wind down in Australia because of that, but it went into the background. It became more in the counterculture and not in the mainstream. But that early phase, there was a huge mainstream interest in, in permaculture. I know that is uh, sort of like, <laughs> A whole history lesson <laughs> but it's yeah my version of the history and the way 
permaculture, like all things, it, it partly has lived and survived on the merits of the idea, the, the energy of the people involved and their efforts and their mistakes, but also influenced by this much larger geopolitical, economic, psych social context, which of course, you know, provides that context.